He's just an actor. He's a stand-up comedian in New York City. That's what his profession is. He's, he's good at it. He earns a living. Making jokes. <laughs> making people laugh. Uh, so it was it a was very new idea. And then Prabhupada started elaborating. Jai Patakra has a good memory for these things. And, and largely our, our congregation will be living, our, our members will be living outside the temple. Largely. So now if people are living outside of a temple, and one of the purposes of ISKCON is to establish places of Krishna's pastimes, what does that mean? Does that mean people's homes are homes or houses and not temples? That, that making that distinction that Prophet made in Detroit. And the idea is to make the house a temple or a place that's Krishna's place. And uh, the way to make a place Krishna's place is to engage in Krishna Bhakti. The, the, the house, kind of like ashram, in the sense of Brahmachari ashram, grahasta ashram, vanaprastha ashram, sannyas ashram. Ashram can mean the, the social order, but it can also indicate the place where you do those activities. The, the Brahmachari ashram is the people that make it up, but it's also the place where the, those Brahmachari activities are conducted. And the grahasta ashram is where people have a home, griha, and they have an ashram, grihasta ashram. There's a very nice section that I've been recently reading from in uh, Kapila Dev's teachings to Devahuti, where, well, there's several sections where he, he gets very specific about how a grihasta should live. And um, one part of it is kind of compare and contrast. There's a whole long section about what Grihamedi life is. And then there's some very, very clear indications of what Grihastha life is. And some of the same teachings that we find in Rupa Goswami's writings about the the, what's, what's the, the standard of detachment for the practitioner of bhakti, Specifically, even for a householder, the standard of detachment for one who is practicing bhakti. And um, there's, there's several elements, but the, the first and foremost and primary ele element is the aspiration for attaining self-realization. And then when that's very strong, then the detachment naturally follows. That is to say, while speaking very strong language against affinity for matter, the body has necessities, and the subtle body has necessities. And so one fulfills those necessities according to the codes of dharma, theistic conduct rules one's life, but most importantly is inside there's a strong desire for self-realization or a strong desire for being situated in one's relationship with Krishna. That's what self-realization is. And he says very clearly, this constitutes being in one's swarup, one's constitutional position, so that during this, this lifetime, one carries out one's duties in a detached manner, and at the end of this life goes back to Godhead. Same thing is what the purpose of a temple is, is to invite people to come to the temple. And what does Prabhupada write in Nectar of Instruction about the purposes of a Hare Krishna temple? Come together and engage in the six kinds of loving exchange. That's the purpose of the temple, to invite six kinds of loving exchange then, he, you know, describing what, what those loving exchanges are. <coughs> he, 
he had a very clear from the outset a very clear vision and each of the things that he implemented study carefully how he did what he did and it was it was these, these loving exchanges like when uh, when one's consciousness is in the modes one isn't going to understand the intention of our acharya our founder we, we bring it down <laughs> to something to passion or ignorance for example this this thing of life members Prabhupada was very clear life membership had after some time become a way of supporting the temple what Prabhupada wanted to do was to give his books so it was a medium where according to the culture that he saw and had come from in India people were inclined to give in charity to the temple but he wanted that they would give in charity to the temple in such a way they would get books it's just his focus was giving like he writes in the nectar of instruction about um, prasadam, giving prasadam I had the experience culturally anybody that would come into Prabhupada's quarters to see him for whatever it was you know any devotee or a professor or somebody or a reporter or somebody he would always make sure before they left they, they had some prasadam his indication was you've heard the, these things before but that everyone within so many miles radius should get prasadam shouldn't go hungry he instructed this was at the Manhattan Center because in Manhattan there's rich people and there's poor people he said there, there the, the in, in all of our ISKCON centers one of these things that was sent to all temples that you should have extra prasadam available so whenever somebody comes they always get prasadam I mean, in one sense it's cultural in another sense it's devotional just make sure everyone had come, he, he had come to give not to take that often quoted exchange when Prabhupada was at Stanford University and when young Indian students stood up and challenged him Swami why have you come here as a beggar and he challenged me back and said you have come as a beggar I've come as a giver you've come here to get an education to get some money and beg a job I've come here to give you're the beggar and I'm the giver and that, because the person was challenging he responded like that but it was it certainly that was his spirit to, to give the opportunity of, of Krishna connecting with Krishna and Krishna through, through devotion to Krishna and establishing situations where people can do that that's what, whether it's a temple or it's a home or it's a little gathering here or there it's, it's giving I just had a very nice experience when I was in, in Phoenix um, the temple president told me of there's a a Chinese gentleman that, that comes to the temple because he knows that I go to China and have some interest and um, he chants and, and uh, be nice if he could be connected with devotional service some more so I sat with the man he came to the Sunday program it turns out he's been he, he when he was he's now 40 when he was a teenager he met devotees in Hong Kong and he's been involved with Krishna consciousness since then he's often not always because he works very hard long hours he chants 16 rounds often he has a full set of Srimad Bhagavatam in Cantonese which is different than the Chinese they speak in mainland and um, he has lots of Chinese friends so just 
as an example, you know, how to how to extend Krishna consciousness to others. So whether he does it in his home or the place where he, could, he works in a restaurant, a Chinese restaurant, he has lots of friends that are so. Get people together. Uh, give some books. Same. Give some books. Give some prasadam, and give some teachings. And connect people to the message of Krishna. So whether it's one's home or a storefront or a temple, th these are oper this, this is a facility by Krishna's arrangement where we can bring people together. to bring the members of society together with each other and nearer to Krishna, the prime entity, and thus develop the idea within the members of and humanity that each soul is part and parcel of the quality of Krishna, the quality of Godhead, Krishna. So bring people together and then establish a place of Krishna's pastimes. So homes can be like that instead of the house as a temple. And what makes the difference? Because here the activities of Krishna are heard and chanted and remembered and worshipped and then when persons come they can see Krishna. Just like you have a nice altar here. In the in the prominent place of the house. I've seen homes without getting into it, you know, where and who but, you know, Krishna's in a closet. You know, where's your altar? And after some time, Krishna comes out of a closet and comes into the prominent place of, of the home. Right? Without details. And when that happens, the, Krishna's in the center. It's actually Krishna's house. Maybe some of you have heard Vaisheshika Prabhu describe door-to-door -door book distribution in San Jose. They do lots and lots and lots and lots of book distribution in San Jose. So one of the ways that they distribute lots and lots and lots of books is they go door-to-door. -door. And in San Jose, both the mother and the father, the husband and the wife, have jobs, and the kids are home at school, and guess who's in this big house? A dog. He's the king, and they're all serving the king. They ring the bell, and the dog is at the window. Woof, woof! Get away from my castle. So if you're not serving Krishna, you'll serve something. If you not serve God, you may serve dog. God backwards is dog. And a temple, or a home that's dedicated to Krishna's service, becomes like a temple. An, an ashram. Grahastha ashram, a place where Krishna's at the center. And then, just as at a temple, just as we're doing this evening, bring people together to have the chanting of the holy name and hear topics about Krishna and Krishna's devotees and take prasadam together. So it's nice to connect. In this, we've been asked, I've, I've been asked so many times, it's kind of like Im embedded now, asked to think how to encourage all of our society's members to think whatever it is that they do in this ISKCON 50 year to connect it with ISKCON 50. So that's why I started thought of speaking about this. Because everything we do is <coughs> certainly can be connected to Krishna because we're the Hare Krishna movement. But specifically then connected to ISKCON 50. The ISKCON 50 means the purposes of ISKCON were established in a formal way by incorporation. 
So how does this connect with ISKCON 50? Because it's one of the essential items of the purposes of ISKCON, establish. So um, I invite you and your family to consider you're part of ISKCON 50 by the very act of dedicating this nice house and Krishna's service, put Krishna in the center, bring people together, propagate the consciousness of Krishna, systematically teach and educate, etc. Engage in Sankirtan, And the, the last, but not least, it's, it's nice. With a view towards achieving the aforementioned purposes to publish and distribute periodicals, magazines, books, and other writings. This is a little plug for book distribution. Prabhupada wanted to see that his books were distributed, as I mentioned with the Life Membership Initiative. It wasn't just get money so we can build temples. It was give people the literature. Because the literature, the Bhaktivedanta purports, was same as Vyasadeva's effort, which was to bring about a revolution in the impious lives of people in general. That was his concern, not just building buildings and gathering gatherings, but giving people Krishna consciousness. Um, another really nice example, prominent from in my growing up in Krishna consciousness anyways, in New York, uh, lots of people are artistic and creative in different ways. Just, you know, the city is like that, so the people are like that. So in, in the course of the expanding, dynamically expanding years in New York, there were several devotees that had become, uh, that had come from a professional acting background. I'll just mention a few. Lohitaksha and Rasigya. You know Rasigya. Huh? Okay, okay. She, both she and her husband have departed this world, but when they were coming to the Hare Krishna temple, they both had, they were married, and they had, a pro, they were professional actors in New York. And we had this policy, very interesting policy, that if you want to move into the temple, these are grahastas, they had a job. If you want to move into the temple, you have to come every morning for Mangal Arti for a month. Stay for the day and then go back home. I don't know how they paid their expenses for that month. But they did that, so they became full-time devotees living in the temple and there were others without a group of others that had that kind of um, professional propensity so they got together and formed a group of um, actors the Vaikuntha players they called themselves and they, they, they really were at it they rehearsed and wrote scripts and costuming and this and that and Every year when Prabhupada would come to New York, it was a big deal to having prepared a couple of, two or three dramas. And Prabhupada would sit right towards the front, very attentive. He was very strict about, he didn't want the devotees to laugh during the drama, take it seriously. If there was laughter, he would stop like a stern voice and say, do not laugh, this is, take this seriously. So we stopped laughing. And they, they, there was a lot of reciprocation. They were offering their hearts and their skill and their inspiration and their ability to their spiritual master. And he accepted that service. So then they started getting an idea of taking that skill and going outside. There's, there's a lot of history, but... So then they gave reports after one of the dramas, and, and Srila Prabhupada, we had this 
fantastic experience at such and such a venue and so many people came and they really appreciated the, the message of Krishna and then the Prabhupada paused and said and how many Bhagavad Gita did you distribute? Oh, we forgot to bring the... You, want, you must take Bhagavad Gita. This is the standard of the success of your preaching. People become attracted to Krishna's message. That's why we have these dramas like that. So he valued book distribution so much. So it, it, it's, it's number seven in the list, but uh, the language is very clear. With a view towards achieving the aforementioned purposes to publish and distribute periodicals, magazines. So whether it's a temple or it's a home or it's a brahmachari ashram or whatever it is, book distribution. Because that's Vaisheshika is fond of saying. Prabhupada called it, this is our family business. And from India you, you all know what family business means. In, the, in America it's not so common. But in India, you all understand family business. And this, the, these literatures, that's our family business. It's our disciplic succession, generation after generation after generation. That's our family business, the spiritual family. So we, we receive these literatures and we distribute these literatures for the benefit of ourselves and, and the humanity at large, counteracting the... Um, inauspicious effects of the age of Kali. Homes become temples in part when that is also something that the home considers, just like whether it's the drama or the Harinam Sankirtan or events where we have book distribution. I'll share one other thing and now I think I'll end with this. Uh, I, I, I learned a lot when I served as the chairman of the GBC. It was really uh, an incredible experience. No one had trained, like many of the services that I had done. Now it's changing a little bit, but I had no training how to do anything. So we need to train people how to do things before just asking them to do things. But I had become the, the GBC chairman. And um, during that year, there was what's the Caribbean island that there was this national disaster? Haiti. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So there was a disaster in Haiti. And I was getting these emails and phone calls, people saying, Are, is, there, is there some way we can help? I thought that was really nice, but I hadn't a clue. What do you do about a disaster area? Not a clue. So I thought I better do something. No one taught me how to handle this thing. So I knew somebody in, in Santa Domingo that's not far from Haiti, and he's a very capable organizer and a service-oriented person. So I said, if I direct people to you, could you help organize some kind of effort? He said, sure. Just give them my, my phone number and email address, and I'll, I'll take care of it. He said, great. So people started writing and calling, and I would just send them to him. And there was a lot of interest, you know, money and going there and doing things. So I was traveling to some other GBC meeting. And I was, happened to pass through London Heathrow Airport and there was a whole, like, seven or eight groups of devotees from somewhere from Europe. They're on their way to Haiti. I just bumped into them. Hey, where are you going? I'm going to Haiti, really? Yeah, we were some of the people that volunteered. You must be the GBC chairman, yeah. And then they were describing, you know, this person knows how to build houses from next to nothing, and this person knows how to, you know, how to s s take soil that's been damaged and 
make it fit for cultivation again, and this one knows how to do emergency medical supplies, and this one has some connection for clothing, and it sounded like, wow, they, they, they really organized. And then they, they said very clearly, but when we do all these things, there's two essential, we, we have made arrangement for books in French, and musical instruments so we can have care time. So we're doing any one of these things, the food relief or the medical or the, the building the houses or this or that. We want to train people in the, the, the rudiments of bhakti. Because we've done this many times. When, you, when people are in such a distressed condition, they're far more receptive to taking shelter of God. So we want to be prepared to give them the help that they need in practical terms but establish a, a, a base of Krishna consciousness in their lives. So whatever the venue, in this case it's in a new home, but whatever the venue, in principle, we, we want to give. And the, the, the ways in which we can give, whether it's Chinese people in Phoenix, Arizona, or whatever, whatever, whatever the venue, Haiti disaster area or whatever it is. It's, it's, it's part of our life of putting Krishna at the center. We, we do these things that are ISKCON's purposes, including this feature of seeing that literatures are published and distributed. It's something that temples or homes that are like temples do. We're, we're concerned. We want to see that this knowledge is given to others. And systematic training in that knowledge back to the very first one. So I hope your new home becomes such a nice place of Krishna's pastimes. That's the desire. Okay. We're getting it, getting off to a good start. Any comments or discussion from anyone? If not, let's have one more kirtan. You have something? Yeah? specific ways by which um, both for oneself and also in training others what, what is it that we can do better to um, inculcate in people the intention of nature big topic I'll say something general and I'll say something specific. And there's so many things to say after that. In May, uh, one of the things I was asked to do was attend a meeting in Italy. And the, the meeting is a meeting of organization development committee. So I, I, the, the intention of the Acharya is con, the, the, the target of this discussion. Um, there, were, there were many topics, but two primary topics we spent time on. And one of them uh, is called the four generations. You, you heard me to describe this? So. There's a devotee from Russia. English is his second language. He's learning English better. He spent three years, he's like a professor, 
some consider him to be kind of like a, a genius, but at least he's like a professor. And he spent three years studying the question, what are the factors that are involved in an organization continuing and an organization over generations stopping or discontinuing, breaking? Very, very thorough, very complex study. And distilled down, because he made it like this big, 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 big thing. He studied not only Islam, but you know, the divisions within Islam and the divisions of those divisions within Islam. And Christianity and divisions within Catholicism and divisions within the divisions of Catholicism. And Protestantism and, and so forth and so on. You know, the European history particularly. Judaism and divisions within Judaism and divisions of division. So, like, very, very comprehensive. And stepping back from all of that comprehensive, he came up with this chart. It's called the Four Generations. Um, and it's so important. I'm speaking about it in Detroit, maybe that's where you heard me speak about it. He did not agree. Okay, 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 okay. So, Here's, the, here's a, a, an image, a slide, and the first generation is, in our case, is Prabhupada. In the case of Islam, it's the life of Muhammad, and in Christianity, it's the life of Christ, or in Sri Vaishnavism, it's the life of Ramanujacharya. And then there's the second generation, third generation, fourth generation. And the, during the first generation, you'll say, during Prabhupada's life, there are these four boxes. So you look at it this way. There's issues that Prabhupada dealt with, his teachings that he gave, there's the context in which he dealt with issues, and there's the intention. Now when Prabhupada was present, one could go and ask him, what is your intention? And then he could observe how he dealt with situations according to context, sometimes this and sometimes that. And even within his purports, sometimes this, sometimes that. So how do you understand the intention when he says sometimes this and sometimes that? You ask him. The next generation, the intention becomes less clear, but there's more first-hand experience of context. Prabhupada disciples, who had his direct association, etc. And then there's his teachings, and then there's the issues. So during Prabhupada's time, he studied. There, there are these, those, those issues, and Prabhupada did the following things. The third generation, that's not Prabhupada's disciples, but the disciples of Prabhupada's disciples, that's largely all of you. Intention becomes less clear, Context becomes less clear, and then there's teachings. And if the teachings get doesn't are not very very strongly and deeply and thoroughly, not just the brahmanas and those that do the bhakti shastri course, and I'll take a course, but the members, not just the teachers of the members, must if we want the organization to continue become very conversant in the teachings primarily his books, and then the other forms of his teachings, his recorded lectures, and so forth. And then there's issues. In the fourth generation, all you're left with is issues. <laughs> so, your, back to your question. How do we, if the modes of nature cover the intention, how do we, what, what is it we can do to um, become clearer about the intention? Well, for starters, and very important is, read Prabhupada's writings thoroughly, not, not with a view to see if what he has to say matches my point of view. Because if you read in that way, you'll find some things that seem to match your point of view, and then you can, you know, huddle around those things. Then there's another group of people that have another point of view, and they huddle around those other things, 
and then you get, you know, groupism. People in answer with each other over this view and that view on things without necessarily having a big picture. It's something that Brajabihari Bihari is very concerned about. I'll just be very specific. When he heard that I was intending to conduct a discussion on, or to host a discussion, or encourage a discussion on Varnashram, he got very concerned. Because some people speak over on this side, some people spoke, speak over on that side. It just becomes dissension. So he was not worried about should we discuss the topic, but he wanted a balanced discussion. It's just part of his service is to make sure people approach things in a balanced way because you can easily just get into disputes instead of clarity. Some take this side. So intention requires very comprehensive and open-hearted receiving the message of our founder Chari through his teachings effort. And that's absolutely essential. It's not um, optional to understand intention. So with, with that intention, then comes the context thing. So, in discussing this context thing, um, there's so many biographies about Prabhupada's life. But speak to those persons who are personally present and they'll tell you, this author, I won't name the, names of the author, this author saw that event that he described in his context-sensitive presentation of Prabhupada's events very different from three other, four other people who were in the room at the same time. So, the historical memory is according to the perceiver. So then you have to thoroughly study those in order to get the context right of how Prabhupada acted in different, different circumstances. If you're lazy or passionate, if those two modes are strong, you're not going to go for the goodness mode. You're going to go for this side, that side, or just not even bother. So it really takes um, dominical effort with the intention of getting the big picture and really sincerely trying to understand the intention. It really takes a strong I want to know, desire, not I want to prove my point, position. And um, second, kind of like as an example of this, when um, I have, I have Every time I have Ravindra Surprabhu's association, my appreciation for him grows. There's lots of things he's not. There's lots of things he is, and what he is is just superlative. So he was given the assignment to, to uh, describe Prabhupada's unique position as the founder of Acharya. He spent three years. People were getting impatient. But you know, he's, he's thorough. He's a, he's a PhD. He, 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 wants to, he wants to know. Not just take a position and just uh, justify the position. But what does that term, founder Acharya, mean? Where does it come from? Etc., etc. All of those. So having done that work, whew, he's just like this ocean of realization about Prabhupada. And his intention, because he very, very deeply studied just that phrase, Founder Acharya, where it came from, how it was used, what it meant, why Prabhupada used it, when Prabhupada used it, why Bhakti Siddhanta didn't use it, although it was, he was ready to use it, but it never happened, so he never used it. Like all that. Of course, that's an opinion, and somebody else can have a different opinion. But it's, you know, there's much closer sense of intention by that 
dispassionate, deep inquiry and investing time and you know it's so many of the the issues that you know go back to that other box the issues and it's really easy to name some issues that get bounced around female diksha gurus is one and varnashram is another and, and with, you know the, and other issues lots of them so what's the, the, you know, the, that's the intention of the author. Well, part of the intention is what he did and what he wrote in his books. Not just an occasion here and occasion there, but is, is there a, a, a theme or a consistent... Anyway, so um, it won't work to understand the intention of the founder Acharya to be lazy or to be um, biased in terms of this view or that view, the liberal view, the conservative view, or the moderate view. That's become, then it becomes political. It's, it's not, that's not the intention of the Acharya, is to create politics. What's the intention? It's, it's a, it requires so I'm seeing these two things. Um, approach with the mode of goodness that says, um, I'm not leaning this way, I'm not leaning that way, I really wish to know. The mode of goodness inquiry, searching for knowledge, not searching to validate my particular meaning or inclination. Because more and more issues will confront. And t I think tomorrow I'll speak of one of them, the unity in diversity message. It's not exactly a housewarming message. Maybe, maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. But at, so, as our society grows and grows and grows, whether it's in Naperville or you know, you know, whatever the picture you want to look at from, diversity is going to proliferate. We want diversity to proliferate. It will proliferate, especially if we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. You know, different. It groups, interest groups of people. Are we, are we doing what, what our founder Acharya wanted? For example, if we're simply reaching to the non-resident Indians in Naperville. Is that what our founder Acharya wanted? He came to America to give Krishna consciousness to the non-resident Indians in the United States. That's not why he came to America. So, what was his intention? And if we, if we think deeply about his intention, then we can make our plan of carrying out his intention, according to his intention. And we put our shoulder to that wheel, etc. So, so anyway, we'll speak some t tomorrow. That's another one of those, you know, in the, in the box over here called issues. We'll make reference to these seven purposes of ISKCON when doing that too. It's kind of easy to be complacent, but it's not. It's it's not. Um, it's, it's not very satisfying, and it's certainly not enduring, and it's not endearing either. To, to endear oneself to our founder Acharya and the mission that he sacrificed so much to establish, complacency isn't going to work. It takes some sacrifice for a, a specific purpose and again focusing on intention. What does he want? And then what are the means to help fulfill what he wanted? And we sacrifice to do that. That's, that's a life of happiness. Okay, so any other? We'll have kirtan.
More kirtan. Is there time for kirtan? Yes. Sanchi, come on.